Welcome back and thanks for tuning in to The Care Corner. This is episode three, part two, the topic of exotics. This time around, we're meeting with Tim Harrison, the director of Outreach for Animals and the main subject in the award-winning documentary, The Elephant in the Living Room. Tim is here today to sit down and share his experiences, his mission, and the dangerous epidemic of exotic animals being privately owned right here in the U.S. Hello, in continuation of the Care Corners episode of Exotic Animals as Pets, we are here today with Tim Harrison, and we're going to discuss a little bit more on this epidemic. So, um, what do you do? It's kind of hard to explain. Uh, I, I, I'm a retired police officer, firefighter, paramedic of the city of Oakland in New Dayton, Ohio. In the process of doing that, years before that, I worked for a veterinarian, uh, Thomas Bird who is also a zoo vet for like the Columbus Zoo and some of the other ones. He would okay. come down to Cincinnati and help out with different animals in Kings Island when they had their uh, safari monorail thing. Right. And uh, he taught me a lot of stuff. And we would go out every once in a while. That's back in the 70s. We'd go out maybe maybe one or two calls a year. Maybe a bear chained up in a backyard or somebody might have had a python or something like that. And then when reality TV hit about in the 90s, I was starting to become a police officer in 81. And about the 90s, 95 or so, when it hit, everything changed. I went from four or five calls a year to going out helping law enforcement officers, animal controls, or people that didn't know how to handle their pets. I ended up uh, getting over 112 the very first year, the most dangerous creatures on the planet because they would imitate what they saw on TV. This week on Wild Animal Games. <laughs> Did you get that? Wild Animal Games at four each weekday on BAM AF TV. Service put a cat harness on her and take her outside with the harness and the leash. I did. She wiggles her way out of that twice. Most of the time. Remember, I say most of the time. Hey, don't eat my glasses. Excuse me. Hey, don't eat my bird. If you're wondering why I'm not taking any phone calls, it's because Harry chewed my earpiece off. So if you have a fax you want to send me, go ahead and send it because I won't be able to take any phone calls as long as my earpiece is chewed off. Um, a monkey is an animal that is never alone. It's always with other monkeys. Once a monkey grows up in a human family, it bonds to that family and it can never be left alone. That means you can never go on vacation. It has to be euthanized because it will never accept another human family. So getting a monkey is a very, um, it, it's a long-term commitment. Long -term commitment. Brian, the umbrella cockatoo, decided to come down and join us again. The different types of toys that are available for pocket pets. <laughs> this year is want to let go of me now. Come on, let go. You're going to get eaten if I pull you out of here. Most children will quickly become bored with them. But they are fascinating little rodents for the rodent connoisseur. Okay, get off my fingers. This guy's feet are made of fly paper. Get off, there we go. Sorry, little guy. Here's a monkey see, monkey do kind of thing. If people don't believe that, always tell them. Think about uh, 101 Dalmatians. Every time that is shown, people race out and buy Dalmatian pups, and then about a couple months later, they're so hyper and they don't want them, they dump them off at the local humane societies. And Finding Nemo. Here's a movie, the whole stinking movie says, don't put me in an aquarium, right? Mm -hmm. Don't do this to me, and all of a sudden, it becomes a $13.5 billion industry the very next year. That's, that's the United States of America. Alone. Yeah, alone. So that's kind of what, I kind of got pulled into that world because nobody else was doing it. Helping, let's say, the, the tigers in Ohio, or the tigers in the United States, nobody cared about private ownership. Mm -hmm. They only cared about the ones in India. We actually have over 3,000 plus that are, we know of in people's homes or backyards in Texas by itself. In Ohio was the worst offender back uh, just a few years ago before we had the Zanesville massacre mm -hmm. and when all those animals were turned loose. And um, after that, we changed some laws here that I've been fighting for before that. But uh, we got laws changed, so we're the, the, we don't have the auctions we had there. They've moved to Missouri, they've moved to Oklahoma, and they moved to Texas now. And they're bigger and badder now. They're bigger. Americans for whom a dog or a cat or a hamster simply doesn't cut it when it comes to having a pet. Their tastes run to the more exotic, like lions and tigers. And the business of supplying such exotic animals has become a multi-billion dollar industry. But what's making money for some could be putting you or your family in danger. Matt Mahar went undercover to document the booming business in exotic pets. It's unlikely you've ever seen anything quite like this. We took our hidden cameras into an exotic animal auction being held in a giant barn on a remote farm about 80 miles southwest of Cleveland. Black leopard and a good one. They're going on all across the country, and this one is perfectly legal. One and a half, one and a half. 
hundreds of people bidding on an array of animals so exotic you would think you'd have to go to a foreign country or a zoo to see them. An 18-foot python. Look at the size of this thing. A kangaroo. A two-toed sloth. And this brisky bobcat. The bidding on this baby cougar started at $500. These baby black leopards are cute and cuddly now. But in a couple of years, they'll look like this and eat up to 10 pounds of meat every day. We watched as this woman auctioned them off for $1,200 a piece. Many of the people buying these exotic animals will try to breed them or even keep them as pets. <laughs> exotic animals like these can and do show up in people's backyards, even in this upscale suburban New York neighborhood. Come here, Paul. You can train them, but you can't tame them. For four years, look what Larry Wallach kept in his backyard a 400 pound bengal tiger it's like playing russian roulette no i don't agree with that i totally don't you agree. have to admit that there's a good chance that any time you went in there that tiger could attack you there's a chance good or bad there's a chance jayton tidwell of arkansas learned at an early age how dangerous tigers can be the tiger bit me while visiting relatives in march of 2000 jayton went to pet a 400 pound tiger similar to this one that was being kept as a pet in the backyard of this house. The tiger nearly ripped the boy's arm off. He was rushed to a Houston hospital, and after multiple surgeries, the arm was reattached. That's when the tiger pulled my arm in. In my view, there should be no private ownership of exotic animals, period. Dr. Rick Villafagna was horrified when he found out his ex-wife and her new husband bought two tigers similar to these to live in the same house as his daughter Lauren. One evening, his worst fears came true. The male tiger pounced and reportedly he pounced over her stepfather onto Lawrence. With the first pounce, the animal snapped her neck. Lauren was killed instantly. She was just 10 years old. I don't want any more parents to have to feel what I've felt for the last five years. <laughs> it's a big problem all the way across the country. Tim Harrison is a cop in Oakwood, Ohio. Officials from all over the Midwest call him when an exotic pet either escapes or attacks. Ah! He captured alligators let loose in a pond, a pet bobcat roaming the streets of Dayton, Ohio, and even a poisonous viper snake that got loose. Check our spangs out, guys. Two boys were found playing with it in a garage. It could have killed them. We had two deaths here in this area within 13 months. We've had numerous bites, numerous injuries from exotic pets. We've had one gentleman lose his finger from a cobra and almost die here recently. Same area right here. We don't need this. It was Tim Harrison who told us about the exotic animal auction in Ohio. Remember the woman selling leopards? It turns out she works for a commercial zoo called Rivendell near Akron, Ohio. The zoo's website warns people about the dangers of buying exotic animals but they actually breed some of them and sell them to the highest bidder. We scheduled an interview with the owner of the zoo, but it was abruptly canceled. Jim, could we talk to you for a moment, please? Oh. The owner's daughter later met us on the street. Because you're actually adding to the problem of exotic animals, aren't and you? I, yeah, I understand because your you, feelings you sell, behind that. you breed that. and you sell pets. I but understand. your website deceives people. You, you lead people on your website to believe that, that you're helping to eliminate the problem, when in fact, you're soliciting money and you're contributing to the problem. I understand your feelings behind that and is, that's is, is that not true? That's why we would have preferred to sit down and have a one on one with you. Let's do that. But we decline. Thank no, you. But what you so what happens when people realize that cute little cat they bought is getting too big? They often turn them loose. To or turn to people to like Carol Asvestis, who runs an animal sanctuary near San Antonio, Texas. How many calls do you get a week? to take animals like this? I'd average about, uh, we get about four calls a day. Four calls, four a, calls day a day for animals? From like all over the United States, yeah. Saying, please take this animal off my hands. Can't keep it, please take it. If you don't take it, we're gonna have to have it killed. Since his daughter's death, Rick Villafagna has been pushing for new laws that would limit the ownership of dangerous exotic pets. I wanna see things change. I don't want any more children to die. One year ago, a federal law was passed prohibiting the interstate sale of big cats as pets like lions and tigers, meaning if you buy one, you got to keep it in the state where you purchased it. Sheesh. I was going to just ask you if you had saw maybe a decrease or increase on 
the amount of exotic animals in people's homes now? It's funny because of my state I have. We were the, we were the biggest auctioners. We were the, the, the world. We have five AZA zoos in our, in our state, which mm -hmm. seems like we, they'd be, be more education going out there, which it is. The zoos are great here. Mm -hmm. The problem is, this is where people come from all over the country. They did not state of Ohio to Mount Hope, Ohio, and some of the other auctions around the state, but Mount Hope is the biggest. And they would buy anything they want. Private breeders would bring them in. Roadside zoos would breed them. And they would just, when they get done with their pay-to-play pet the, pet the cubs at the fairs, mm -hmm. they would dump the animals off once they reach there. We call that the expiration date. Once they reach that certain size, you know, working right. with animals, you can't deal with them after all. They, exactly. they don't need you anymore, you know. And uh, now we have a, a dangerous animal. So they would take them to these auctions, and they'd auction them off to the highest bidder. And then, then we found out after doing more investigations is that most of those highest bidders came from canned hunts that came from Oklahoma, in the state of Ohio, and Texas. So people would pay large amounts of money to kill a domestic, basically, tiger. And as we know, none of them are pure. They're mm -hmm. all, you know, they're Siberians and Bengals, and they're basically mutts. But we, we, I call them American tigers because they are our tigers, and everybody seemed to forget them. We need to take care of our animals we have right here. But it's, it got worse. It actually got worse because it starts spreading out more. And I thought once we stop it here, we stop it there, it's become more of a, uh, that's what we need. We'll talk about the, the big law, the big law I'm trying to pass now nationally, Big Cats Public Safety Act, just okay. for big cats, because it's becoming such such a danger out there for law enforcement. We're always right. the ones that have to take care of it. It's not, the, it's not the local zoos, it's the police officers and the first ones on the scene. So is that a like new um, new training set up for everyone in law enforcement now to be able to handle these cases since it is becoming a larger thing going on? You know, Raven, that's uh, a very good question because we have started, now I've been helping everybody, everybody I can mm -hmm. through programs and teaching here and there. There's no police academy. There's no college that teaches law enforcement has anything to do with the dangerous wild animals, okay. even though your chances of running into one are high, as mm -hmm. we have in the United States. But we just finished with Michigan State University a book that's going to be sent out to all law enforcement, FBI, and everybody else that deals with these animals, cool. and it's going to tell who the numbers are to contact, who the emergency people are in each state, what to do, what animals to look out for, what's going on. So it was along with Michigan State University stepped up and said, hey, we're going to put this together. And along with myself going to teach at, I went to the intervention conference they had, the 900 police officers that did human trafficking, drugs around the United States of America, the top guys, they came in, guys and girls, and I sat there and I did a, 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 a seminar for them when I first got there. And, you know, there's a few people in the seminar, you know, everything was cool. They said, oh man, we need you to do another one on Friday <laughs> because everybody's got a story. They went out and started saying, hey, this guy's for real. You need to go listen to this stuff because everybody ran into a mamba. People run into a perfect example in Texas. I was down there, I teach at Disaster City, which is a big training facility, not for animals, but for human disasters. Okay. Uh, down at Texas a &M College, we bring people all around and teach them how to play well in natural and man-made disasters. Well, in the process of doing that, I was down in Texas and a woman was selling six tiger cubs out of a van in a Walmart parking lot in McClellan, Texas. Now, there was no law in Texas for her, except if she sold them, they would have been. When the law enforcement officer pulled in, he saw a bunch of people around the vehicle, the van, he took <laughs> off running. So he locked up the doors, he got a warrant, broke in, thought it was going to be a, a drug thing. It turns right. out six tiger cubs. So they confiscated them. So the prosecutor down there in the Dallas Zoo said, oh no, they're not getting them back. And they had to interview me, and I said, oh, she's getting them back, and she's going to file a lawsuit. Because you can't take them, you have no law against right, it. Right, there's no laws. Should they get them back? Okay. Same in Zanesville. When they removed those six animals and took them to the Columbus Zoo, what yes. happened? Major lawsuit. Mary, now the, the, the wife of Terry Thompson that turned the animals list lives in Hilton Head now. And we don't know what happened to the six animals she got back. Marion Thompson has a right to the animals, and without uh, the law that we're trying to push through in place, um, she doesn't have to follow any standards, such as the standards that zoos follow or some of the sanctuaries and other facilities that are, do a good job. It's a sad day to know that they're going back to a situation that hasn't changed. And, uh, you know, our team and our business through the Zoo Association, AZA, uh, works very hard to have the highest standards for public safety and animal welfare. So we have to be careful. We have to play by the rules. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That's Outreach for Animals, my organization. We're police officers, firefighters, paramedics, emergency room doctors, pediatric physicians, lawyers, and veterinarians that all got together to teach proper behavior around wildlife. It's not being shown on TV. And I do enjoy your YouTube show because you do get the information out, which a lot of people aren't doing. Yeah.
Um, actually, this topic and quite a few other ones have been important to me since I can remember. I actually did, um, what was it, my freshman year of college, I did a paper on the exotic animal trade. And that's when I first heard about it. And then I think maybe a little bit later is when I ran into mm -hmm. your um, documentary, Elephant in the Living Room. And I was like, how come, and, I, and I asked all my zoo friends, I was like, have you guys seen this? Like, never heard of it. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> th and then I think it's crazy just because it's right here mm -hmm. in Ohio. And like, I've grown up here since I was in second grade. So mm -hmm. I knew like kind of the areas of what you were talking about. And I'm like, it was right here. And then, like you said, the Zanesville incident happening. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's so sad. They killed all those animals. I'm like, well, in retrospect, like looking at the whole thing, there was not anything else that could be done because the time was running out as far as finding them. They're out here with, you know, pedestrians and people just having regular lives, everyday lives. And then the sun was going down and that could have been even worse. Oh, yeah. So I understood what the office had to do and stuff like that. And with a lot of cases where there's animal attacks or whatever, people are like, you know, why don't you tranquilize and not realizing mm -hmm. large cats, especially that does not take an effect and it's it's a have to shoot to kill situation unfortunately yeah and people like you say don't realize that they watch tv shows and that thing will tell you that and these reality shows when you dart something but first of all you have to know how much it weighs yes and then mm -hmm. you have to dart it you don't know how much the adrenaline rush is because i've actually had to dart a bear eight times because he would just shuck off shuff off the you know burn off the, yep. the, the, the ketamine and the, and the drugs and uh, in Zanesville, it was impossible because it was raining, it coming dark, and we had 38 big cats. There's 56 altogether, Jeez. grizzly bears, bears, everything, baboons running loose through this community. And, and I did it on purpose. Mm -hmm. So that was even, even more treacherous. That uh, this was, did, it was a situation that was, that was a terrorist activity where he turned these animals loose as a weapon to go after the police and the people that put him in prison uh, a year before that for drug or for running guns. Mm -hmm. And he even said in court, Raven, he even said, it's not a freak accident. He, he said in court, he said, if you put me in jail, Judge, for these guns, and when I get out, I'm turning my effing animals loose, I'm going to blow my effing brains out. And what did he do? One year after he got out, one year, two weeks after he got out of prison, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a uh, and I was fighting the whole time. <laughs> fighting, oh my gosh, fighting. Governor Strickland and I, if you saw the movie, we actually had laws. He was voted out, and, and Governor Kasich said, we don't need them because Jack Hanna told him we don't have a problem in the state of Ohio. And then Zanesville happened three months later. Right. It's a horrific scene. The bodies of wild animals lying in the mud after a terrifying day and night in Ohio. Altogether, 49 animals were killed, including 18 Bengal tigers, 17 lions, and six black bear. But what this carnage was this carnage necessary to spare human life? And should there be laws on the books against owning these exotic animals. Here with more on the story is retired Ohio police officer and the founder of Outreach for Animals, Tim Harrison. Good morning to you, Tim. Hey, I'd like to say good morning, but man, uh, this is the elephant in the living room. This thing's been hanging over us for years. and I've been doing this for 38 years, Steve, and this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And my heart goes out to all the police officers, the sheriff, uh, Jack, all the people out there. It was just a horrendous scene. You know, maybe, Tim, it's the fact that we've seen so many wildlife shows on TV, but why didn't the officers try to use go get the dart gun first rather than shooting them dead? Well, when you show up on a scene, you don't have a dart gun. Take it uh -huh. from a police officer, firefighter, paramedic. And I teach for Homeland Security also. You don't have those things in your cruiser. And if you're going to shoot something, sometimes it takes up to 20 minutes for it to take effect. Uh. If a tiger's charging you, you ain't got 20 minutes. Right, exactly. Now, this never should have happened, but Ohio's got some yeah. laws on the books and an executive order expired back in April. Next thing you know, you got this. Yeah, absolutely. When, when that, if that law stayed in effect, I don't want to armchair quarterback. I don't want to look, you know, look like I'm a bad guy. But I'm telling you right now, if the law stayed in effect that Governor Strickland had, by May 1st, 2011, those animals would have been removed from that property because this gentleman would not have been grandfathered in because he had citations in the past for animal cruelty. Right. Uh, he had an, an animal to get loose, a lion get loose, and walk around the community. They'd have been taken off the property safely like it should have been. Tim, have you looked into why this happened? I mean, I heard a news account this morning that said, that apparently the guy who was not liked by his neighbors and his neighbors complained a lot, uh, a lot about him, what he did was to try to get them back, he let all the animals out and then killed himself to get the neighbors. Well, nope. 
Yeah, nobody knows for sure what went through his head, but I would say that's probably it. He just got out of jail, prison, whatever it was, for what, uh, another offense. I'd say it was a payback situation. But people say, why do these people have these animals in the first place? I'm getting a lot of people asking me that. I say, see the documentary, The Elephant in the Living Room. It explains it all. It explains everything. It was almost prophetic to what was going to happen. It, it almost predicted this to happen. But I used to be one of those people. I used to be a person that raised exotics. I right. had lions, tigers, and bears, and I say, oh, why now? But, uh, yeah, I understand why people want them. Absolutely. And then you have the case of that Charla Nash uh, a couple of years ago, the woman yeah. whose face, uh, her life was destroyed by a chimp. These are not pets. They are wild animals and they should stay in the wild. Uh, Tim Harrison, thank you very much. You are an expert at this and it's great to have you this morning live today from Columbus. Hey, thanks a lot. You guys take care. All right. You as well. So, and that's why the uh, Orlando Sentinel and some of those other newspapers, some of the top uh, movie critics actually said, The Elephant the Living Room, the movie that predicted Zanesville. That's sad. Yeah, it is. Especially, yeah, that's, oh, geez. We could have stopped it. Definitely. You know? And I think most people, a lot of people, especially in the zoo field, are concerned that they're target, like, that people with, who want these laws and these changes and laws to come into play mm -hmm. are thinking that they're targeting zoos when it's not no, zoos. No, We're no. targeting private owned things and these sideshow zoos and people just having animals in general. Absolutely. So and that's what the Big Cat Public Safety Act is. And the reason I put the public safety part of it on, because nobody senators and Congress people don't care about big cats, trust me. Even they can you know, unless something happens to them personally. Mm -hmm. Now you put the public safety on there. Oh by the way, you know, the tiger that got out just last year and went down the Interstate seventy five, got out, went down to the bus stop there in Atlanta. He was shot, and that just happened, and, then he, and he was shot by local police departments with their handguns. And he was right there going to a bus stop. Now, nobody raised their hand, so that was my tiger. We had to wait three days to find out it was Ringling Brothers Tigers they were transporting. The guy lost it while he stopped at a gas lost. station. Yes. It's a, it's a sad story, but it's the typical story. It's either somebody's pet. It's either a circus. Just like you said before, we're not, nobody's after the AZA zoos. They're mm -hmm. our educational facilities. Right. They need to be around. That's the ones that should be fighting with us. Right. And we're having a lot of trouble with, my, our, with people like getting mis misunderstanding of what it is. I speak to all the zoo directors. They're all says, Tim, we're behind you, but they won't put it on paper. Right. Because they have uh, certain individuals fighting to keep us keep us from stopping these private breeders mm -hmm. and things of that nature, but we, we don't need to go too deep into that. That's one of those situations where uh, somebody needs animals to do pay for play for certain areas that don't belong to, let's say, the zoo. Right. So that's where we have problems. Now, 99% of AZA zoos are right on board. It's just got a few, and that's what's causing the problem. Yeah. So with people owning exotic animals as pets, do you think they have a healthy fear of what they really are dealing with. Because I, I'm a zookeeper, so mm -hmm. I know every day when I go to work and when I'm working with these animals, they're dangerous. It's not a, it's not a, oh, he knows me. No, we know that every day, stay focused, do not let your guard down because they're unpredictable, they're wild. Mm -hmm. So like the people with these animals, do they, do they have that healthy fear? Or is it completely oblivious, like over their well, head? This is what they see. When we ask him, Mike Weber, who is the filmmaker mm -hmm. of The Elephant in the Living Room, he says, Tim, you're blaming the media too much. He came out with me to film for the first year, year and eight months we filmed the, the Elephant in the Living Room. And I said, you start asking these people why they got these animals. Mm -hmm. Steve Irwin, that's why I got my Cobras. I want to be Steve Irwin. I want to do just like he's doing on TV. There's nothing dangerous about this. I can do this. I got these cats because of Awesome Possum on Animal Planet. Shows experts raising tigers in their homes. That went on for a whole season. And then you go out and you ask the people, why did you get this tiger? Why did you get this tiger cub? You know, you live in downtown Dayton. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, the guy had him in his house. I thought I wanted to do the same thing. You know, like I say, monkey see, monkey do. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes from their mouth to the actual, to the face of the, the guys in the media, he's right. like, holy crap, this is the reason why. Right. And there is no fear. Because you go to Africa, like the, the, the doctor here from Miami Valley Hospital, mm -hmm. Dr. Pahoka, yes. six months in Africa, six months there. We don't got that problem in Africa. We don't play with them over there. People don't bring them into their backyards. They don't bring them into their homes because they have a healthy fear of them. Mm -hmm. You go out to where there's grizzly bears and people live out there on ranches, they don't play with grizzly bears. They don't bring cougars into their homes, and they don't bring wolves into their homes. They have a, a, a respect for the wildlife, right. and they need to be there, and this is where I am. 
you've got people that, that the main people that buy these animals have no idea what they're getting into and they grow so fast because the, the sellers and the breeders will tell them if you feed them this way and you leave this out of their diet they'll stay under 200 pounds you've heard that yeah. if you do this you take uh, you cut the tail off they can't jump on the couch we had a lot of cougars there for a year for years they would dock the tail off and Wow, declawing is the biggest thing. Like Dr. Jennifer Conrad is a friend of mine. She has the Paul Project, mm -hmm. and she's helping captive cats that have been declawed. But it's okay for him. Oh, yes. It's common procedure. He'll be a bit sensitive when he wakes up, but we'll keep him here to relax before sending him home. Great. Thank you. Here we are. Come here, baby. He made a hip surgery just now. You can pick them up any time Wednesday. If you knew what declawing really was, would you still do it? Please, don't declaw your cats. And she, she'll tell you that's the biggest problem, especially with these uh, magicians and uh, Siegfried and Roy, those kind of people. They declaw their animals. Now they're very hard to find sanctuaries because you have to have special places for them because you can't put them over the other cats can't defend themselves yeah. and then they can't walk and that's damaging yeah and even you know to your that. domestic house cat so Absolutely. i can only imagine a big predator like a cougar 500 pounds tiger can you imagine trying to walk on those paws no. we see declawing as an act of animal cruelty declawing is not just the removal of the cat's nails but it is the amputation of the first knuckle private owners and exploiters do this because they think that it makes the big cat safer to handle even Big Cat Rescue's King and Queen of Beasts have both been declawed. All this does is potentially create health problems in the future such as arthritis. A bad declaw job can make claws grow back in weird spots or can cause mutated claws to grow back putting uncomfortable pressure on their toes and their pads. Riza, our cougar, walks with a limp and has to be sedated from time to time to trim down the mutated nails that grow back from her botched declaw job. Big Cat Rescue condemns the act of declawing, and you should too. I do that, and I run into that quite a bit, and it's one of those things where the people have good intentions, just like Terry in the film. Mm -hmm. He had good intentions, and everything's great until they got too big, too, too much out of control. They escape, that's usually when I come in, or somebody gets hurt on the property, or the owner goes, oh, he almost got me. And that's why that, if anybody ever tells you, Raven, that they raise cats, mm -hmm. and you'll hear these people when they go to courts and all these, you know, go to city council meetings and stuff, I, I've never had anything to fear from these lions. I said, you are a liar. If you've raised lions in your home, you've raised lions for all these years, you've been attacked. Something's happened and you can put a chill down your back. And they'll look at you and smirk, because they know it. And you know what I'm talking about. You can, that cat, that tiger, could come up and, and all of a sudden, go, just mm -hmm. that fast. And it's an instinct. That's what they're supposed to do. Chris Rock said it best, and his quote is in my new book called White Magic, uh, Curse of the White Tiger. And he says it beautifully. He says, you know, that tiger did not turn on Roy. And I don't like the term turn. Me either. The tiger said, he said, the tiger did not turn on Roy. That tiger went tiger, and that's the greatest tiger show ever put on stage. Because that's what a tiger's supposed to do. It's the largest predatory cat in the world, the largest killing machine cat. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about doing magic tricks, does it? No. It doesn't say anything bring it in my home, right? No, it says right there, I am a tiger. I am made to be a predator. Right. I am not made to be your, your, your basset hound. I'm not made to be a pet. And there's where we get the miscommunications. You get this magic shows, Las Vegas pounding. You got TV shows where just lovey dovey rolling around mm -hmm. with declawed animals and surgically altered animals and medicated animals, which is a big deal. They right. give them a little something to take the edge off. And then you're on these shows. Because there's one thing I always catch people when I do the, when I did the film festival series, when we won everything. Right? Mm -hmm. We won a Genesis Award, beat Oceans from Disney with the elephant, well, we beat everything. But it was so funny because these celebrities have come up and I said, you know, the, the, that tiger cut you were on with on the David Letterman show, you, did, did you realize it wasn't really acting like a tiger cub? It was a little bit more lethargic. I said, usually pound moving around and constantly mm -hmm. energy. Yeah, it was kind of funny. I said, do you think they're going to bring a tiger or a real cobra out and put it on Jay Leno's desk? He can't ride a motorcycle during filming times because of the insurance. I said, they're not going to bring a real cobra out. Those are venomoids. So I started teaching people, look at this, look on the, the, the cheeks are sunken in. They're taking the venom glands out. Yeah. You'll see the yeah. tigers, they've been declawed, the bigger ones. And they have something to jump up on the couch and lay there. And I sit there, they got something to take the edge off. They're not going to bring a real dangerous animal onto any of these right. shows 
with these celebrities who have high insurance already, mm -hmm. so they make it to the movies, and they start waking up, and they go, you know, you're right, and so I'm starting, I'm starting to pull more of these people in. You know, people are starting to pay attention. Yeah, yeah, about the common sense stuff. That's why I try to drive a little common sense, and I know it's difficult because common sense ain't that common anymore. But <laughs> we try to drag a little in there. The reality TV now, uh -huh. nowadays we got social media, so yes. we have what, yes. Facebook, yes. Instagram, Talk everything about it. like you're that. Right. You're absolutely right. It's it takes a second to post something mm -hmm. that just goes viral. Yep. So like you'll see a lot of the videos with the, the slow lorises and like putting their arms up, and people are like, "Oh, it's so cute! It's being mm -hmm. tickled." And actually, it's terrified, and it's building up venom glands. Or you see people with, like, like you said, wrestling around with cubs and all these yeah. other things. So, as great as social media can be to project the positive messages that we need, and people truly start waking up, how detrimental do you think that is compared to just reality TV we're battling back then? Well, you hit around with us. I, I have been so busy working. Mm -hmm. I've got a young gentleman by the name of David Enden. He's done some TED Talks and things on Big okay. Cats. Young, just graduated with a bunch of degrees. He's ready to take off. He's, I'm kind of mentoring him to take over after me. I'm 62. I want to make sure we got somebody staying on the same message. Okay. And he hooked me into this Instagram. And I'm looking at this. I'm saying, how do you fight this? Mm -hmm. Every celebrity, everybody. And you got this guy called The Real Tarzan yes. now. And I'm looking at this. And I'm going, the guy has no idea what he's doing. He's just getting pictures taken with the animals. And I'm thinking, this is dangerous, and it already has been dangerous. Mm -hmm. Kids in the, in, the, in the inner city are starting to pick up stuff. Yes. They should leave it alone. I, you, I was growing up a country boy. Mm -hmm. You don't pick up snakes. No. Okay, even though I love snakes, okay? You don't pick up snakes. You respect them. You know, you leave them alone. You go do your thing, right? You watch these TV shows. Watch what happens with the Instagram people, their heroes, playing with these animals. Mm -hmm. Kids will walk right out, and their parents will go, what can they pick that snake up for? You know, you know, I never taught him that. Who taught him that? Well, it was this individual on Instagram. It was his, his hero. And parents need to pay attention to that, too. Not just from that. Take it from the law enforcement aspect, too. There's things going on that need to pay attention to. Right. You know, you know that. But with the animal stuff, it's quicker, it's faster than the reality TV. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the youth are going away from reality TV. Yeah. Every, everything's right on your phone. Right so on your phone. Someone's so they're trying to talk me in and start doing some more Instagram stuff. The younger people are trying to work with me. Yeah. And I agree with that because if you got this, if you see a lion with his paws turned all the way in like this, been interbred like crazy, hasn't been fed properly, the bones aren't structured properly. You see this guy, it kind of takes away from the real Tarzan mm -hmm. a little bit. And that's what I'm trying to lean into now. I'm trying to get people to, uh, when I do my speaking engagements at colleges and stuff, I always tell kids, don't believe a word I just told you after I finish. Go out and investigate it yourself. Yep. And you'll be surprised. Thousands go out and they look at it and it's worse than what you say. Always lowball it. Mm -hmm. Always lowball a little bit because I want them to be stunned. Because I say, oh, that is not me at all. 15,000 tigers in the United States. Oh, wow. And they'll go out and go, oh, my God, there's just that many in this side of the Mississippi. Wow. You know, they start <laughs> looking into it, and it gets them so excited and fires them up. And I call it stoking them up. Stoke them up and then turn them loose. And that's where we're, we're getting these laws. Just think about it. You're a young lady. In my lifetime, I never thought in my wildest dreams there would be no more orcas caught for the wild, no more orcas bred in captivity. Never thought that. Never thought it would ever happen. Think about that. Our Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Paley Circus were close. Right. You know, and they're brutal to their uh, elephants and stuff. And that's the one that got loose. It died about it from one of them. And I know where they were going, too. So yeah, yeah. the whole sad part about that is, is that for all these years, the people, you know, when there was a movie called Free Willy a few years ago, yep. everybody wanted that, that whale to be turned loose. Right. Turn him loose, turn him loose. I was the one, if you go back and look at all that stuff, going, please don't turn him loose. Yes. He can't live. You, know, yes. you can't take a tiger that's been you raised. You said it. Exactly. Well, go away. You can't do it. He's not going to survive. He doesn't know how to eat. He's not structurally strong enough. Mm -hmm. He's kind of basically, is, after three or four or six generations of being in captivity, their muscle structure. Just That's why I tell people, if you ever get a chance to go to India, go to Africa, take a look at that lion, and then are going to look at a circus lion, you're going to go, wow, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. That over there is like Twiggy or right. somebody, you know, there, there's a whole different body structure to mm -hmm. it. You know what I'm talking about yeah. when you see that. There's that muscle, that, especially the black leopards. You can see it with that silhouette when they move, whoosh, the muscles pop up. See them in captivity, you kind of go, it's kind of smooth. And I'm kind of going, and that makes me sad sometimes. Mm -hmm. But what I like about a lot of the AZA zoos is they do enrichment, mm -hmm. which these cats, you can see that a lot of times in some of the cats. You can see the shoulders. Yes. And it brings up. <clears throat> 
a lot of people don't realize they need enrichment. Absolutely. They need human contact. <clears throat> people don't, excuse me a second. You're fine. <laughs> but they need human contact because people keep saying all the time, you know, there's groups that say, don't touch them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if you're a professional at an AZA zoo, you have to touch these animals. There's a guy named Jay, Jay Pratt, I think it is. Okay. He's uh, he's working with clickings, making noises, oh, animals moving. Oh, clicker training and such. Yeah, all the stuff. Great, great way to, to draw blood. They did a beautiful video where the, uh, the lion came up, put his tail through, mm -hmm. and they drew blood. At uh, Sanctuary Alliance. Okay. And they don't breed, sell, do photo right. It's a true like definition a true of a sanctuary. sanctuary. We're against uh, handling the animals. Now that's because you have a lot of volunteers. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of people, and there's no professionals, but you don't want to cross that line. Right. We, as you just you know, saw what happened down in, um, I think it was South Carolina, North Carolina with the young The guy. young uh, yeah. intern. Intern. Yeah, yeah, with the line. You've got to be careful because even the slightest mistake mm -hmm. is, is fatal. And I've lost friends over the years uh, in situations like that. I lost, lost one friend by three cougars attacking and killed her. Lost a friend being bit by a venomous snake and I and I lost another friend being constricted bit by a snake. And all three of these people were, I would say, top of their fields. They knew exactly what they were doing. And that's even more scary. And that was all here in the U.S.? Here in the U.S. So Not with... Counting out, now we're going to go outside the U.S. and we got a whole bunch more. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because you got a lot of people going into countries they should not be going into unless they're highly trained. Right. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people look at it as like, oh, I need to prepare on what's out here and Absolutely. stuff like that. So like you were saying, like, unfortunately, I'm sorry to hear about your friend um, yeah. with the venomous snake situation. Was there not any anti-venom or anything like that available? Because I know, in my, well, this is what I've gathered from what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. um, how you show in uh, Elephant in the Living Room where you guys went to that auction, there was all those venom and snakes, mm -hmm. Gaboon Vipers and everything like that. If someone the, takes the that home, cups, just like yeah, just regular <laughs> tiny little cups with red labels. That's it. Something like that gets out or someone gets bit. The hospitals around here aren't equipped or prepared nope. for a situation like that. Nope. So, what it what is, I guess, what is the plan of action to prepare for something like that? The only thing I can think of is there, like, if there's a zoo nearby, they mm -hmm. potentially would have the anti venom just because they have venomous snakes there. Mm -hmm. But here in Dayton, the closest zoo is an hour, hour and a half away. Yeah. What what is? And maybe that zoo doesn't have the, the polyvalent or the, the monovalent for that specific animal, which right. happened which happened to our friend. Okay. But we were able to get uh, a monovalent of a rhino viper from uh, a, a reptile uh, a lab down in Kentucky mm -hmm. that they flew it up. They, uh, the, the troopers drove it up to a location, then they flew it in. Okay. And they were able to get it to him and pink him up, and he was able to, stable enough to be flown by air care to Cincinnati to a, a physician down there that knew what he was doing. But the problem is, is that he had been down too long. And people don't realize that people do have allergic reactions to the venom itself, too, because they're, they're, they're allergic to horse venom. Yeah. And there's like 45% of the population will die from the, from the anti-venom. So, uh, yeah, the anti-venom is not gold. Right. It's just something that might help save your life. But again, people have to realize when they get these animals, the local doctors and things like that have no idea what happened. And one, one young lady down in Cincinnati, another story that I was involved with, Alexandria Hall, she actually ordered herself in a root tube off the internet after watching Steve Irwin. And um, what happened was is she brought it in, she opened up, got, just came in like UPS, opens it up, opens up her new toy, right? Opens it up, the snake bites her, okay? Scratches her, you know, because it's never, all, not always to puncture, right. it's, it's going to be a scratch. Be a warning too. So she goes not feeling too good. And it's a, it's a cocktail of death, cytotoxin, mm -hmm. neurotoxin, hemotoxin, you don't know what's going to kick in first. So she goes to the hospital, learns from him, they got no idea. They're looking at it. doesn't look like a snake bite to me. It looks like a scratch. Mm -hmm. They send her home with Augmentum for uh, pain. She goes home the next morning. Her daughter finds her. Every orifice of her body bled out mm -hmm. in her bed. So then we went to get the root tube. So the root tube itself, I, went, I started doing a bunch of emergency room doctors and nurses and paramedics. I did tons of those over the last 29 years. I have seminars for them, what to look out for, what to pay attention to. I always started off with the emergency room doctors. I walked up with an, a vial of anti-venom okay. that we used. It's empty now, right? So I bring it up, and I bring the directions that come with the anti-venom, because it's from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I walk up, and I hand it to him. Okay, you just, 3 o'clock in the morning, a woman just came in here and said she got bit by a root And I said, everybody here knows what a root is, right? And the, none of the doctors do. I said, how about you from the zoo? 
don't know what Rutu is. Rutu is kind of a, 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 is, is a pit viper from South America. They, it's a, it's a more native name for it, but if you okay. look it up, it's a very pretty snake. But it's a, it's a pit viper snake. So uh, nobody even heard of them. But it was shown on Steve Irwin, and two or three people in the United States got bit over a short period of time because everybody went out and bought it. It just right. happened the woman from Cincinnati did. And she ended up dying. So I asked him, I said, okay, now that you know it's a venomous snake, now you know it's a venomous snake, it's a, it's a pit viper, let's go ahead and get the directions out. And they laid the directions out, and it's an Afrikan. Okay, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to call somebody. Who are you going to call? I want to call the zoo. And I look back at the two people from the zoo back here. What are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know. We don't know what it is. Okay, okay. See, see what I mean? That's where the danger comes in. Mm -hmm. All right? So we have to pay attention to, if you're going to get an animal like a tiger or something like that, so I say no, absolutely not. Because right. when I tell people, you know, everybody wants a tiger cub, but nobody wants a tiger. Right. And, you know, and... and, and they're cute when they're small. Absolutely. Everything is. <laughs> right. Except for venomous snakes, as we know, they're more potent when they're small. <laughs> small. So uh, it ends up with those situations where, um, you know, they don't, they're not prepared. They get it and they're not prepared for anything. Because I'm not going to get bit. I'll never have a car accident. I'll never get cancer. I don't know that, you know, typical invincible. American mentality, I'm invincible, I can do anything I want. Well, and I, can, and I have the right to do it. That's where we get into a lot of arguments mm -hmm. with uh, uh, lawyers and stuff. We have a right to own tigers. No, you don't. There's nothing in the Constitution that says anything about, you know, oh, there is one thing about animals in there. It says your right to arm bears. No one says bear arms. That's the only time an animal's even mentioned. I didn't say it in the Capitol building, right? right. Nobody <laughs>, laughs. But the whole thing is, I said, there's nothing in there that says you have a right to do this. You can't own dynamite downtown mm -hmm. in almost every city in America, but you can bring, you know, 500 pound, the most largest predatory cat in the world without, as you saw the sheriff, when the lines got loose on the interstate, he goes, mm -hmm. you got to have dog license for your dog. You don't have to have nothing for a lion. Right. And think of the zoonotic problem. And yeah. when, when you watch the extras of the elephant in the living room, you're going to see the, 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 the director, Mike Weber, almost died during the filming of the show from a uh, skin condition he got off. We didn't know what it was. We sent him to the Cleveland Clinic. We sent him everywhere with human doctors. It was a veterinarian that figured it out. The, state, uh, the deputy state veterinarian who works with us at the Outreach for Animals says, you got a mite infection from African lions. And he goes, what? And his skin was sloughing off on him. He lost weight. And you'll see him, uh, you'll see him talk about it. But it's uh, the zoonotic stuff's even more dangerous because emergency room doctors are why they're on board with us. Mm -hmm. Is because we're getting stuff we don't even know what it is from right. these little reptiles and these other animals, and we don't know what it is. We have no concept. In which technically you guys shouldn't have to worry about. Absolutely. We're used to zoonotic diseases or things be yes. prepared for in the zoo world. So mm -hmm. just to hear everyday people, that that's insane. Could you, it is, and if you, and the, the sick part about this is, just from a public health standpoint. Mm -hmm. None of these exotic animals should be here. You would love to see keepers, the people that actually care for the animals, if they can do it, even do little programs. Definitely. You know, don't, uh, for each animal, for just people walking up. Yeah. You know? Because um, Cincinnati Zoo is actually where I started mm -hmm. my entire <laughs> zoology yeah, like career. Um, that was a big focus was going out, like taking uh, maybe 15 minutes going out in front of the public yes. to educate and do things like that. And I think, like you said, kind of back to the um, real Tarzan guy, mm -hmm. and now you have inner city kids, because in the black community, there's not many people that look like us that work with animals. Mm -hmm. I see it every day at work when I do it's make sad, an appearance in front of there, and they mm -hmm. see me, they like, ask me thousands of questions. You're not scared and all these things and I, I've never really been the healthy fear yes but not to the point where I want to harm it or kill it or anything like that I have complete respect for animals so when going out in front of that I, I enjoyed it they still do they have a dollar day where a lot of the inner city people and people who don't can't afford to go to the zoo often come and I remember there was about 30 kids and then me and my um, partner we had a snake out and I think it was a dermal's ground boa oh, yeah. and um, you know, keep the keep the face and the head away from them, and we watch the tail. And we, you know, we like you know tell the kids calm down. We talk about it. They get to touch it, and like their faces just light up. So I I personally enjoy the education part, which is also why I started my YouTube page. What I want to do is do more animal education, on especially things that I don't think it's talked about enough, like this situation, exotic pets. I don't think it's really voiced a lot, besides what I've heard from you, and then what I hear and see online and then I'm like don't share these videos you're just helping the problem and such like that so yeah it's definitely something that I would want to be more a part of and I think there's a lot of zookeepers that 
genuinely enjoy mm -hmm. educating for sure. Right. I do have one of your videos that you sent me. Okay. And I did want to kind of give an idea of... But you can use anything you want. Awesome. Oh, wrong password. One, Nikita. Yeah. This, uh... That was uh, like, horribly abused, not by her. Right. She was horribly she was abused awesome. before she came to... Uh, this is a private owner, too. She's a private owner. Yeah. She actually worked for Sam Mazzola. I don't know if you remember what Sam up in Cleveland. He's the one with the bear ate the boy. Oh, okay. Property. Yes. Okay, that's Nikita. That's the one that they used softball bats on. Softball? Train them. So they can stay. They chain them up so tight. Mm. I'll see if I can send you that picture of a newspaper article where they chain them up so close to the ground. She'll sit there and snarl, but she can't do anything. They give okay. her little drugs, and people come and get their pictures taken at the fair. Wow. So, yeah, she was beaten horribly. A lot of these cats, as you'll see that we rescue, I didn't see any surgical stuff. That's what they got in. But we have to take care of their teeth mm -hmm. and everything else because they have fractures in their face. And when they grow into them, people go, oh my gosh, this tiger's just, he's just so upset. He's never been like this. So we do x-rays on them because i got a whole bunch of veterinarians, a whole bunch of human surgeons right. that help me out. And they get in there and look at the x-rays where there's an old fracture right here growing into it. Right you know, And it's just making them mad. It's, it's painful. So we have a lot of surgeries we have to do on these animals too. That's what people don't realize before we can even move them to a sanctuary. To a sanctuary. Yeah. So this woman here, she's a private owner, right? Yeah, that's Denise and Jose. They had eight big cats in their backyard that they rescued from they were San rescued. They, Okay. Nobody else wanted them, and they took okay. them, you know? And that's what upsets me a little bit because there's no other organizations. Plenty of these organizations are taking millions and millions and millions of dollars, but they don't give a crap about the tigers in the backyard. One location in Lancaster, Ohio, we took 16 tigers out of a woman's backyard, 10 African lions, 7 wolves, uh, 6 cougars, that's, we'll talk about that later, you'll see that, and uh, one black bear all by himself, and she started off with one cougar that she bought at an auction. And when everybody else found out she had a cougar, and she was a, she was a well-known uh, lady of the evening to okay. a lot of well-known people, and she owned some gambling stuff. So she, that's how she paid for her animals. And people started dumping their animals off on her. And she called us up and she goes, hey, I, I want the guy from the movie. Can you help me? And that's what happens. And uh, I wasn't ready for this movie. Uh, we had no, tons of good. people, I mean, not ready for the response. People are calling from all over the country. We want the guy from the movie. Well, anybody else on my property? So it got overwhelming and still overwhelming, but that's what happens. And that's what happens with Denise and Jose, they were saying Zola. And Sam Zola was getting shut down and everything else. Okay. And, you know, he ended up uh, dying mm -hmm. near death. But he, uh, they end up taking some of the cats and, and, and protect them. One of the uh, cougars they had on their property, badly, badly declawed, looked like raisins, horrible. It had to walk on Astor. She had Astor turf for it to walk on, cross-eyed. Uh, and it had been beaten so badly, it had skull fractures in its head. Uh, yeah, Tasha, her name was Tasha. Some of the things you'll never forget. Some of the things I've seen. And people say that these animals, they, you know, when you rescue them from that little cage or you rescue them from a corn crib, You'll take them into a four or five acre facility and that cat or that elephant or that bear will walk in that same, same 20, you know this, mm -hmm. 20 foot area for, it could be a year before they break it. All right. And then last but not least, but I think you mentioned briefly earlier, there's a new law that you're working on trying to get passed. Yeah. What is that about? It's a, it's, it's a law called the Big Cats Public Safety Act. Okay. Uh, Tippi Hedren, who was in the movie The Birds, and some of those, she's an actress out yes. in California. She read my books, and this is well before the. We're just starting to get into probably, possibly do the documentary. So Mike actually went out with me to meet some of my friends. You know, he's filming the director. Mm -hmm. So we go out and we run into Tippi and Tippi. I said, Tippi, you know, you know, you changed her ways. She, you know, she's she was the one she kept animals and everything yeah. for a while. Okay. So she changed her ways and she's trying to get this law passed called the Big Cat uh, Act, and she couldn't she couldn't get no traction on it. So we're out there talking, and she's saying, Tim, you know, you know, she always calls me my sweet Tim, right? My sweet Tim, I can't figure out how we can get to sit next base. We can do it. We're at her kitchen table, and I said, let me just tell you what I've done in cities in, Oakland, or in Ohio. I said, Rep, uh, exotic animals and public safety act. And she, her eyes went, walk. <laughs> and I said, because it's the cops, it's the police, mm -hmm. fire, and EMS, and animal control that has to handle these. The zoo ain't coming. Nobody, it's experts are going to come out here and do anything with that. And you can't blame them because this is they're in, they're used to work with animals inside an area, a safe area. What are they going to do with it? They can't take it back to their zoo because it's not a pristine animal. Mm -hmm. It's not. What are they going to do with that animal? So I'm in a weird 
predicament here where I have to go and do this and I have to take care of these animals. So people didn't get the wrong idea. So I said, what we're going to do is going to, of course, always the cops are the first one on the scene. Always, 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 right. always. Even with the San Francisco Zoo, if you remember, mm -hmm. the boy was killed and the two other ones mangled. Yes. They, they hit in the cafeteria and called 911, which I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. But two cops that I actually went through the training at Disaster City with me, they're like, Tim, we actually had the, the dash cam on the original. It's so intense when they pull up and there's a dead kid and the tiger's on and then blood and all this stuff. We had to take that out of the movie because that was too intense. Sure, sure. So uh, they had to shoot it with their sidearms. And lucky enough, they would kill it. Right. And that's on the zoo property. Right. So I started pushing then for the ACA zoos to have their own response teams. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did with Ringling Brothers and these circuses. I said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. If you guys want to come, you can bring your circus, but you just have half response teams. Yeah. You have to have rifles. You have to have dark rifles. You have we, to have, have we have that at my, at my yeah, view. Yeah, but the circuses don't pay for that. Right. They couldn't pay for that, so when two weeks after we left uh, uh, Washington, D.C., they folded. Because that's, the, that's what they're getting ready to do. Con Congress and everybody else is going to have to have your own response teams. Right. Couldn't afford it. So the Big Cat Public Safety Act is going to combine with all it goes after is private ownership, roadside zoos that are not credited, mm -hmm. And it's a situation where we're going to get away with this pay-to-play kind of garbage where you do the, the fairs and all that stuff for these animals because they just disappear. Nobody knows what happens to them after we're done with them. Right. So we're going to do away with that. That's what the Big Cat Public Safety Act is. It's going to protect the public. It's going to protect the responders. It's going to protect the big cats. So when I went out for the first congressional briefing on that, and uh, I may have to send that to you. It's pretty pretty wild because to start off, we all thought we were going to have 30 people in this little room for the congressional briefing. It just mm -hmm. packed. We had Congress people and senators step up during our speech, oh, wow. say, can I talk? Can I talk? Or, yeah, go come in here and talk. <laughs> so it was one of those things where it just kicked off because I went around and spoke to 36 different uh, Congress women and men and senators within about a week's period of time, and I fired them up on this public safety part. And, I said, and it's funny because I'm not going to say who, the, uh, who they are, but some of them actually said, we're not interested in this, and I could see them in the office, the, the big wheel, because they were sitting back in the office. And I said, so you're telling me you don't care about cops? You don't care about the public, public <laughs> safety? That's what it is, it's a public safety act. And that's and I was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> see what I mean? Yep. So I'm just the type of personality to do that, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm not no, uh, I'm not some off the wall advocate. Right. I'm just here telling you, listen, we got a problem. And you are gonna be told you can't stick your head in the sand anymore because now you've been told, you know? So that's what it is. We're trying to, trying to save big cats. And we're trying to protect the responders and the public. So there's no interaction, because I can guarantee you, as you know, if there's interaction with any big animal, any exotic animal, with anybody in the public, it's going to be a sad outcome for that for animal. Sure. We right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, Is there anything you last thing you'd like to share? Well, I would just like to say, if you're interested in buying exotic animal, if you're watching TV and you think, hey, I want to be like, you know, Jack Hanna, or I want to be like David Salmoni or these guys on TV, just go to the library, go to the zoo, and ask one of the zookeepers, should I should I get one of those as a pet? Now, why would you listen to some clown on TV when you should go to talk to somebody that's actually every educated day, yeah. and works with them every day and say, hey, I say even talk to your veterinarian. You know, they're gonna tell you, oh, heck no. Right. You know, people are loving these animals to death and it's very true. It's very true because they love, literally, as like Terry did, love their animals. And now I want you to think of the animal's point of view. Mm -hmm. Here's that, here's, we'll just use Lambert, the lion. Here he is, and Terry says something at the beginning of the movie about that. Here he is, this cub being raised and sleeping with you every day, every day, every day. All of a sudden it gets to about 100 pounds, 150 pounds. I can't handle it anymore. He puts it out in a crappy cage. Yeah. What's that lion think? What's wrong with me? Why yeah, do you love me? Why do you love me anymore? Mm -hmm. And that lion breaks a bit. Yeah. Now you've got a danger. You mess with nature, you're going to get bit. And that's exactly what happens. And there you have it. The Outreach for Animals founder, Tim Harrison. Thank you so much for sitting down and meeting with me. I thoroughly enjoyed hearing your mission and experiences. If any of you out there would like to donate and learn more about his organization, Outreach for Animals, please check the description box below this video for the website links. And thank you so much for watching in the Care Corner. Until next time.